This conference will now be recorded. Here we can see the Asher Code of Ethics for anyone who wants to take a look at it. Um, essentially, any and all proprietary information shared is Asher's property and is accountable and is punishable under these Code of Ethics. Um, moving forward, um, waiting for more people to join. In the interim, we will have a video on Ashray in the meantime. So, Kiran, if you, if you could. All right, cool. No problem. Give me a minute. No problem. Just keep it back on to the... It's... Just let me know when you got it. Yeah, so... Please enjoy this video in the meantime. One way to be an ethical person is to join an ashtray. You want to get out of it? The response that you get and the effort that people put out. Without the, without that, it would not be a fun job, I can tell you. I'll just play Max up that I was given. He said, I've taken so much more away than I can give. I've worked for nothing. It's a blessing to, to have these these kinds of people as friends. And I mean they're big yes. big and hard. Hello? Glad to have friends like that. time I was 10, I knew two things. I knew I wanted to be a mechanical engineer, and I knew I wanted to work in the HVAC industry. And I have no idea to this day why. I took an HVAC class, the only one they offered, and it wasn't taught by a university professor. They had some guy who'd been a consulting engineer, and he taught it on Saturday mornings. People were giving me copies of articles, or handbook, and telling me to look here for this calculation. It was basically my engineer system coming to my office where I belong to that, right? That's one old call from one of local chapter members. I just don't know. I still don't know why, how he got my phone number. Anyway. I think I paid eight dollars, you know, or something of that for my student membership. But the best part was I got the thick green 1981 Ashray Fundamentals book, and it had so much cool data in it that I could use and learn from. I went and sat in on a couple of committees uh, as a very young man, young practicing engineer, a technician, and uh, was in awe of the brain power on the table. I found like-minded people when I first started participating in, in ASHRAE and with my father having already been in ASHRAE. There was no question what I was destined to be part of the ASHRAE family. I had to bike myself to the American consulate and request them to get these standards. So that was my first experience. So I fell in love with ASHRAE at the time. It's almost 50 years now. Thank you. 
When I started, I had a calculator. I had my sling psychometer, a compass, a few other things. My first uh, desktop that I got at the office had a, uh, a five megabyte hard drive with two, two and a half megabyte partitions. And of course, international phones were very, very expensive. So if you had to call somebody, you just wrote them a letter and waited a month for the, for the answer. It was, it was all hand drafting. And we had vellums and we had mylars that we would do hand drafting. We put them back in the drawers and then pull them back out when we didn't make changes on them. We're starting out because it's good at times. The impression of the building was perfect and how it ran right and everything was great, but I was told otherwise pretty quickly and we're in that first hand. There will always be a need for a technical society such as ours in, in our particular specialty to provide the expertise that we do provide and to come together as volunteers to be able to make that happen. Is making sure these buildings are more sustainable, greener, so that it helps the future generation that includes my daughter, which is Annie, and I hope that I leave a good world for her to live in the future. The little contribution each one of us can make will help lead a legacy. And I don't believe it's necessarily the legacy of each individual person. I think it's, it's some of the parts. That gives us an opportunity to be major players in the next 125 years. Okay, cool. That was a small little video showing what the value of ASHRAE is. Um, for those who don't know, ASHRAE is just simply the American Society of Heat and Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. And it is what has brought us all here together today. And it gives young engineers like ourselves and many others outside the field of engineering the opportunity to excel in their study. Um, moving on to the rules of the presentation. Um, any questions that you may have during the presentation, just simply type them in the chat and after the presentation has concluded, just hit enter. So we'll be taking questions after, but please pay attention and save your questions. We will get to them after. Just a little profile on Ms. Risa Munsi. She, ha she um, has about 12 years experience in the human resource um, industry across many different industries, such as the energy, oil and gas, telecommunications, manufacturing, and advertisement. Areas of expertise include employee relations, performance management, recruitment, training, and development, and compensation and benefits. She has worked in small, medium, and large organizations, as well as multinational companies with operations in other Caribbean markets. In recognizing employees, in recognizing employees as companies' greatest asset or liability, she is committed to unleashing the best in employees and assisting organizations in this quest. She's passionate about human resources and sharing her knowledge and best practices. What a CV, and here she is without further ado, Ms. Risa Munsi. Also, the presentation will be available on our YouTube page for anybody who wants to see. Okay, so without further ado, Ms. Ms. Munsi, please continue. Hi, good night. Hi, good night. Okay, great. I just want to make sure everyone is hearing me. All right. So before we start, I just want to say, um, I mean, these type of presentations, we would normally do face to face. But um, COVID-19 is putting all of us, you know, in new elements, we are embracing the technology across all industries. So we are doing this workshop here through this format. Um, so ideally, I mean, I know questions will come to the end. So, but if you want, you could type stuff along the way. If you have any questions, um, I'll address it in the end. Right, so I will start. So resume writing. Now, I know that I think the majority of the persons in the audience are students. Um, some of you all may have some work experience, 
Um, some of you may currently be employed, but whether you're looking to move on to new employment because you are upgrading your skills and qualifications, or you just want to switch, you know, careers, or you have you are a student and you are going to be applying for jobs soon, your resume is the first uh, document that you that you will be presenting to an employer. Now, the reason, and therefore you're making your first impression. Now, this is not to add anxiety, but is to understand the importance of it. Now, and why I started with COVID-19 is that it is having quite an impact, right? Not just in our lives, but we also seen it with organizations, as well as it's impacting uh, employment opportunities. So we was are uh, going into a phase of what you call, or uh, we are already in a, uh, a of what you call an employer's market. And an employer's market is one where there are more people looking for jobs than there are actual jobs in the workplace. And what that will mean is that as candidates, uh, applicants, they really need to put their best foot forward in a very competitive market, right? Recruiters are going to be experiencing an increase in the volume of applications that are coming through their doors. And they have to go through all of these resumes in a short time because they have deadlines. So you want to ensure that your resume is one that provides all the information that they need in a short list and is one that stands out in a very competitive market, right? So that's one of the purpose of this exercise of this work session this afternoon okay so one of the questions that uh frequently asked i don't know if anyone was going to ask it here is what's the difference really between a resume and a curriculum vitae right which we know as a cv now a resume is really a summary of your academic qualifications your work history or experience credentials and other accomplishments and skills this document is i would say in our job market is most uh, frequently requested, right? And the goal of your resume is really to make you as the applicant, your stand out amongst all the other resumes that are before an organization. Now, this is typically one to two pages in length. It can be three pages depending on. I'm um, in a further slide, I will get go into more detail with regards to the length of a resume, right? And uh, a curriculum vitae, right? It's a Latin word for course of life. This in itself will tell you the, that what is expected with a curriculum vitae is that this is an in-depth document which describes your whole course of your career in full detail. So you go into a lot more information, a lot more extensive information with regards to your academic background, right? Including any teaching experiences, de degrees, research, publications, presentations, and other achievements. We typically find a CV may be requested when for academic positions or medical positions, right? Um, a recruiter may request that. Now, it is important in any job application to be mindful what a recruiter is asking for. So sometimes a job application may ask for a CV and therefore you should provide that extra level of detail and other times they may ask for a resume in which case it's going to be the format that i would say we are more accustomed to okay okay so well we kind of highlighted a little bit before the importance of the resume right this is your first interaction with the recruiter right it's a representation of you on paper right and you are competing with hundreds of other applications and i want to to give some insight into how competitive the market can be, right? For certain roles as a recruiter, when you place it on one of the most popular sites that we, we have in Trinidad is Caribbean Jobs. And for certain roles, if you place a job ad, within hours, you could get 100 plus resumes. So imagine if an ad runs for one week, the volume of resume that a recruiter has to review. So it's crucial that you really, you know, make a good first impression with your resume, right? And I mean, you only have one chance to make a first impression. One page resume, 
So I'm sure you all would have heard, you know, your resume should not be more than one page in length, right? I would say, and it's that this is no longer really relevant or applicable, right? That you, especially if you are in a point of your career where you have extensive qualifications and experience by trying to, you know, fit into this, uh, this so-called criteria that your resume must be in one page, you could be leaving out pertinent information that a recruiter would need to make a decision because when they are shortlisting. To me, what is more important is the content of your resume, right? So that is not to say that a resume should be eight pages long or five pages, but it is what you put in it that is of importance, right? So typically resumes, I would say, are normally two pages in length, right? If you are very senior in an organization, you may go into three pages, right? Um, and the reason why the one page resume is really may not be relevant in our times is that persons now have multiple academic qualifications. So the list and certification, certification so can be long. Um, also, in the past, most persons may work for one or two employers, so their employment history may not be very extensive, but I think we can all agree that the current way that we work, uh, we will find ourselves moving from job to job, you know, as we progress in our career, and therefore we have a lot more work experience, and it is important that this is captured in your resume, okay? Now, with that in mind, something to be mindful of is uh, higher up you go in your career, you can eventually omit some aspects of your work experience. And we'll get to that in more detail. So for example, if you are an executive and your first job was an intern, you may no longer need to put down all the duties you did as an intern because those type of fluff is what will make an, a resume overextensive, right? And the key is that it will no longer be relevant. In doing your resume, you want to ensure that it's relevant to the job application. Okay, so resume content. So this, these are some of the typical areas you may see in your, that you should have in your resume. Um, we will speak a little bit later where you might see the ordering may be different depending on where you are in your career and depending on what you want to highlight, okay? So I'll give you all a quick example. If uh, you are at a stage whereby you have a lot of academic achievements, so therefore, but you don't have a lot of work experience, so you're entry level. So what you want to highlight is your academic achievements. You will find that your education, you will place that higher up in your resume so that it stands out to the recruiter, that's something they see first. If you are mid in your career or very senior, you would want to highlight your work experience because it is given if you are a manager that you have some level of, you know, you have your, your qualifications or you have enough experience in lieu of qualifications. So in a case of, like, of that, you may want to put your, your experience higher up in the order of your resume and then the qualifications after. If you are in a point of your career also where you have a lot of achievements, Again, it depends on the role that you are applying for. So if you are a salesperson, you want to show your ability to sell. So you may want to put your achievements higher up, even before your experience, because you want to highlight to the recruiter, you not just meet, but you exceed your sales targets. And you know, you um, close sale in a, below what is required. So you wanna highlight achievements, right? So we will go through now in detail each of these areas um, in your resume. So the heading. So the heading is usually, this is at the top of your resume. This should include um, details such as your name, contact information, and email addresses. Now it may sound simple, but believe it or not, I have come across resumes where people leave out something like your name or your contact number. Because sometimes, you know, you I don't know, maybe you're too anxious to so focus on, you know, the content and the academic qualifications and these little details you may omit, or you put it at the bottom of a resume. 
but it has to be somewhere where it's easy for the recruiter to identify who is this person, who is the applicant, right? When they want to contact the person, they want, don't want to be flipping through two pages or three pages to look for a contact number. It should be easily visible, right? And your name should be in a larger font. It should be bold. It could be in another color, right? So it's very easy to identify this person. Okay? Um, email addresses. Um, in this day and age, we still have to emphasize the importance of having a professional email address, right? So your email when you're applying for work with an organization should not be Party Girl 2020 or, you know, Bad Boys for Life at Gmail. You know, again, we might think who on earth will do that, but there are people who still, you know, use these type of email addresses. So your, for, for work purposes, for job applications, your email address ideally should be a name. Right, your first name underscore dot your last name or first name, you know, plus your last name at Yahoo, Gmail, whatever it may be. Right. Um, something to consider also is that you want the email address to be, um, I would say something short. So don't use nicknames because a recruiter automatically thinks it's your name. So if you so don't use an, uh, a home spelling of your name or something like that. Because this this may throw off a recruiter who might be sending you. Because when they set up an interview, they typically will send you uh, a confirmation email. So you want to ensure that your email address is something that's easy, right? Mm -hmm. Optional information: you can put your career or professional background, um, such as, and you'll see that in the examples below. So if you are a mechanical engineer by profession, an accountant, a human resource um, professional teacher so therefore it becomes very easy for a recruiter when they are going through your resume to to see okay what what is the background of this person right um because the key is because a recruiter is going through such volume you want to make their life a little easier you want to make you know the process of them going through your resume easy right um other information that uh, persons normally will ask if you should put on your resume is like if you should put your address, nationality, religion, the answer to that all depends on the job role, right? So if it is a job application where they indicate that we will be hiring within a, a certain uh, re, um, location, so if it is that they say applic applicants only from um, south or within, so for example, when certain institutions like fast food industries do this typically. So if they're hiring for Shogunas, they will ask for applicants to be within that location. So in cases like that, or in the oil and gas sector, if they're hiring by in their catchment area because they have certain criteria to hire to hire within the area of the of the plant or where they have business, then you want to include your address. Right, because that may be a different uh, uh, shortlisting criteria. If they do not ask for that, I say leave it out because your address can work for or against you. It can add bias. So for a recruiter, if you put if you are living in Point Fortin and the organization is in Port of Spain, they may naturally assume, which is accurate, they may think, okay, this person wouldn't reach to work on time. But that's an unfair assumption. So you don't want to include information that can allow a recruiter to be biased against you, right? Um, religion is something, again, I would not advise that you would put unless you are applying to a faith-based organization, right? So if you are applying to a, a school that is run by a certain, you know, some, some organizations have a, they will hire only of persons of their faith and you are of such faith, well, then you include such information. Or if the um, job application indicates that this is for local applic applicants only or persons who can work in Trinidad, you may want to include that your nationality is Trinidadian, especially in a case whereby you may have gone to school in another country. So, 
therefore, if a recruiter is going through their, your resume, they may assume that you are not of Trinidadian descent, but you probably are. So you may want to highlight that your nationality is Trinidadian. So again, I want to highlight uh, it all depends on the role that you are up, uh, that you are applying for and what the application, the organization is requesting from you. You give that type of information. Um, I have seen resumes where people put their ID card number, again, not applicable, your driver's permit, only if they ask if you have a valid driver's license and you say, yes, you have a valid driver's license, but you do not need to put the, the number. When you get to the hiring stage or the interview stage, they may ask you to bring in such details. You don't need to put your NIS and BIR number. Um, in terms of photos, sometimes persons ask if you should include a photo. Um, typically, resumes that originate out of the Latin American area, we see resumes with a photo because that is something that is common in that area. It is not something common in Trinidad. And again, something like that may work for or against you, right? Of course, if it's a role where you are applying to be a model, the pictures are required. So again, it all depends on what your role is. Um, in terms of physical requirements, in, by, in terms of demographic information, again, you will provide that only if they ask for it. So if there's a height requirement for a role, will you provide such information, okay? Section titles. Now, your resume is going to be made up of a lot of words, right? You want to ensure that it's presented in such a way that, again, is visually appealing, easy for a recruiter to navigate and to read. So you want to, the different sections that we are going through, you want to ensure that it is easy to identify. So to do this, you can use different fonts, um, different colors, different size, different background colors or line separators. Because when a recruiter is going through a resume, they will first, the first point of shortlisting typically is qualifications. So they may want to just go straight to that section to ensure that the resume meets that minimum standard. Once it meets that, then they may look at additional certifications. They may go to um, your work experience. So you want to make it easy for the recruiter to identify and to read and to focus on the areas by which they're shortlisted, as opposed to just have it like paragraphs and, and so forth, where it may be difficult to discern such information. With a resume also, you in presenting information like your work experience, you don't want it to be a paragraph, you want it to be bullet points that it's easy to, to read, right? Again, visual healing is important. Um, these are some examples of resumes that, uh, I mean, you can see it's very easy to identify. You could see the person's name, you can see the role that they are interested in on their background. Right. If I wanted to look at what their skills are, I could just go straight to that section. If I want to look at their education, I could go straight to that section. You know, so you want a resume in a format like this where it's easy on the eye and visually appealing. Objective versus profile. So on your resume, after your heading, right, your header information, you may want to put um, an objective statement or a profile summary. Um, so the objective statement is usually a brief but a specific statement outlining the type of employment or the exact position that you are applying for. So if you put uh, that you are applying for an accounting assistant role, you wanna you you put that uh, and you also wanna highlight the role accounting assistant and maybe bold it so that it's very clear to the recruiter to understand what role you are applying for. Now, sometimes persons put in the objective that they are applying for any role that, you know, the, that any role that the organization have, has that are vacant. Now, again, it depends on where you are in your career, but you may want to be a little bit more specific. So, if you know that this organization typically looks for salespersons or admin persons or data entry, you might want to outline a few positions because when you leave your, your resume very open like that, like any job that is available, 
you may find yourself being filed under other. And, you know, because the organizations have a resume pool, and if we cannot, a recruiter cannot clearly identify what a career this person is interested in, they may go in the other pool, which is the last point a recruiter goes back to when they're looking through their resume pool. So you really want to be specific. You can say you are interested in multiple roles. So if you are interested in admin assistant, receptionist, you can include that. But again, you don't want to leave it so open-ended, okay? A profile summary, on the other hand, is whereby you detail your strength, your experiences, interests, skills that you have to offer to the employer. So persons who are mid in their career or senior, they may, they, you will not really typically see an objective in your resume, but you want, they may show a profile or a summary of their work experience. Again, this will be about two or three lines that really gives the recruiter uh, a brief idea of what, it, of what uh, your background is, what experience you have, and what you really will bring to the table in an organization. Okay, the other section you'll typically have would be your education, certifications, and skills. Um, this should be categorized individually, so you should not see it all coming down in bullet form, right? Um, education here refers to academic achievements such as um, CSEC, CXC passes, diploma, degree, masters, professional qualifications. So if you have ACCA, SIPS, or whatever professional qualifications you may have that's relevant to the job, you want to state the institution and the achievement dates. Now, for persons, I mean, the um, who are at university level or postgraduate level, when you are listing your education, you do not need to get into very nitty gritty details with what you would say are your foundation level academic achievements. So if you have your master's, you will put your master's degree, you will put your bachelor's degree. You do not need to say you have 10 CXC passes and list all of the subjects and what your grades are. Those things are no longer relevant because you have an academic qualification that supersedes that. So by listing all of those CXC passes, you are just uh, occupying space uh, that is uh, that could be put be to better use, right? Of course, if you are straight out of school, now you know have your CXC or CSEC passes, you want to include those level of details. So you want to state not just five CXC passes, but you actually want to list the subject and the grades, right? Because I have come across many a times where persons who, you know, you put on your resume CXC passes, right? They may not even put the amount of CXC passes or the subjects. And for certain roles, it may have that, you know, the role must have a, a CXC pass in maths or English. So this puts an added level of a recruiter having to call you to get additional information. And if a recruiter has a because they are shortlisted. So if they have a sufficient pool that provides all the information, they will not uh, reach out to you for that additional information. So it is important to, to put uh, the information that is required, uh, that is being asked in a job ad, right? So if uh, the job ad is asking for five CXC passes, inclusive of maths and English, you want to include the subjects that you have and you want to show your grade to indicate that you have a passing grade, right? So that's education. Then we come down to the other section of certifications. So this will be your training certificates, short-term courses, right? Certification here um, may also be certain licenses that depending again on the job, um, if on the job ad that you may want to highlight. So if it's a job that is asking if you have a valid driver's license, put that information in. Don't assume that, hey, I am, you know, 40 years old. Of course I have a driver's license. If that is uh, listed as a requirement on a job ad, a recruiter is going to review a resume based on that. So they want to ensure that you want to ensure that your resume clearly shows that you have that certification, right? Um, so 
I mean, in the oil and gas sector, there are lots of certifications that you must have, right? If you work in point leases, they would ask for things as plea, your plea passport, store, which is safe to work, Tibosier, right, to work offshore. Again, if you're applying for jobs in these sectors, these are listed as requirements. You must and you should put it in your resume, right? Because a recruiter is going to assume you do not have it. Okay. Skills. Skills here refers to technical skills, computer proficiencies, and any other skills that you have that the that the apply, that the job ad is asking whether that the job ad is asking whether or not you have. So you want to tailor this section based on the job ad. So every job ad has the requirements. So you want to ensure that your resume reflects that you have the requirements based on what the job ad is asking. Now, this is important for many reasons. One, um, a lot of organizations, especially larger organizations, they have what you call an application tracking system, right? Whereby the first pass at resumes is going to be a software. And this software will be reviewing resumes based on what uh, the requirements are. So if they're asking for an engineering degree, you need to reflect a new or a mechanical engineering degree and you just put that you have an engineering degree, your resume will not be shortlisted because you do not have what you call keywords. And that is important, okay? And in presenting this information, it is important that you present it whereby you put your most recent achievement first. So you're going to go date order in terms of your most recent achievement, right? Of your education, certification, and skills. Experience. This section is extremely important, especially for persons who are mid-level in your career. When you are at this level, everyone who, uh, who may be applying for the job will already have the academic qualifications. So what will set you apart from other candidates is what you put in this section, because this is where employers want to see things that you have done, what you have achieved, the type of responsibilities you would have had, projects that you may have led, right? So your work experience, the content in this section is very important. So you, you want to start with your most recent experience. So you don't want to start with, you know, you are an intern or your summer employment as the first, you know, thing that the first um, section on the, in the experience area. Right? You want to start with your most recent job, right? You want to also put the, your job title, the organization that you work for, put dates also. So if you've been working 2016 until present, put that. If you work, you know, 2005 to 2008, put that because an employer wants to see a job history. Um, sometimes, you know, persons where they may be out of the workplace for a while and therefore they have gaps in their resume, they may um, intentionally leave out dates. Um, I'm not recommending that you do that, but if persons have different reasons why they may do that, but it will be asked in an interview. So, and nothing is wrong with gap years, but just make sure you're honest as to why you have gaps in your resume, right? In outlining your experience, you don't want it to look at, as a, like your job description. I've seen many resumes where you can tell the person all they did was they cut and paste the duties in their job description and put it as the work experience. What you want to do is you want to tailor this to reflect things that you have done in the organization. You want to use what you call action and power words. These are words such as manage this, led the team to achieve this, assisted in the achievement of. Um, you know, compile a report, right? You want to ensure that you use these type of words that, you know, reflect things that you do in the organization, right? So it shouldn't be responsible for, again, this would be, this would be words that you would typically see in a job description. In outlining your experience, you want to use past jobs, 
past tense rather for past jobs and you want to use present tense for present jobs right for your present work experience um, all right and we spoke about dates you want to include dates where possible okay achievements this is an optional section uh, again it will be dependent on where you are in your career if you are entry level um, therefore you don't have a lot of work experience you will not have a lot of achievements um, if you have uh, if you have achievements related to school and academic that you wish to highlight you can highlight um, but if you are in your career mid and senior level you should have an achievement section and this should be high up in your resume right because this is where you want to demonstrate your accomplishments in your work experience because we have a saying in recruitment or in HR that past performance is the best predictor of future performance. So if your resume, you highlight to me things that you have achieved in the past, I am going to naturally assume that when you come to work in my organization, you will also bring uh, these, um, the tools that you've used to achieve these objectives, you will also bring it to the organization. So if you were able, and you want to quantify it. So you don't want to say increase employee morale. That means nothing, right? Those are just nice words. Or reduce absenteeism. What you want to reflect is you want to show quantitative achievement. So you want to say once, again, you want to be honest. So you want to say once you achieved it, 50% reduction in um, receivables, accounts receivables, or 50% reduction in absenteeism rate, or, or, or improvement in uh, 100% completion in projects, or 100% or 90% 90 to 100% on budget uh, projects execution. So you, again, you want to demonstrate your accomplishments and you want to quantify it, percentages, so it becomes very easy for the recruiter to see what it is that you have accomplished because these are things that you look out for in a resume, right? Interests. So persons may ask whether or not this is a section you should still include in your resume, and I would say yes. This allows the employer a little bit of an insight into who you are and gives the resume a little bit of a personal feel, right? Um, of course, you want to be honest because this is a job application. So again, I've seen persons put that their interests or hobbies sleeping. When you say that, I think you're going to be sleeping on a job or watching TV or video gaming unless you are applying for a role to be a gamer or a gaming designer, being a, a video gaming expert in an accounting role may not be relevant. So you wanna ensure that your interests are honest, but also relevant. So don't put uh, that you like to read and in the interview, because they may ask, because this allows uh, the, the things that you put in your interest section, it allows for it to be a conversation starting in an interview. So if you put that you love to read because you think that is something nice or that you know that will look good in your application and in an interview they ask you, so what is the last book you read? And you say something like, uh, you know, a book that you would have read when you were in CXC, that you had to read for CXC. Then you are essentially a lion, right? You have no interest in reading. So you want to be honest, but you want it to be something that is relevant okay and sometimes depending on what you put it may be you may find yourself having a conversation or relating to somebody on the panel so if you like to watch cricket or you like to play football that may be something that you know appeals to somebody else on the panel references so this typical typically will be the last section in a resume right um, employers prefer references from previous employment. So managers, supervisors, right? Um, so, so I know sometimes persons put their friends, they may put their pastor. I mean, while you may put it, it doesn't add much value because when employers do reference checks, they really, con they really contact past employers, okay? 
Also, you want to provide accurate information. So you want to put the name of the of your reference. You want to put their job title, the organization they work for, contact information in terms of a number, an email address, right? Um, you should always seek permission from references before you put their name on a resume because you don't want where you call, where a recruiter may call a, a, a person that you have listed as a reference and they are, uh, you know, say, but I didn't give that person, you know, permission or I didn't know that person put my name as a, as a reference. This kind of reflects, you know, badly, you know, or on a candidate. So ensure that you get permission from a person to list them as a as a reference. Right? Ideally, you want to list at least two workplace references, and one should be from your last employer. Because let me tell you, even if you don't put your last employer, the it is clear on your resume who your last employer is, um, unless you were dishonest and you omitted it altogether. And therefore, an employer could call, call and just call the employer. So you might as well be upfront and provide the information. There, most of the times you see, I wouldn't say most of the times, but sometimes on resumes you see the line references will be available upon request. It doesn't make sense to put that, right? Um, employers will always request that information, so it's better that you provide it. Okay, again, you want to make the life of your of a recruiter a little bit easier because they are dealing with volume. Cover letter, right? Um, you may ask whether or not this is necessary. Um, if it is requested, then you must submit a, a cover letter. Sometimes you would see how when you are applying for jobs online, they may actually ask for the cover letter separate from the job application. So therefore, you should have it as two separate documents, right? Um, the value of a cover letter is that it affords uh, you, the applicant, an opportunity to really highlight your strongest qualifications or your strengths. So, you know, really, you sell yourself uh, more in a cover letter. Of course, uh, there is a high probability that a recruiter may not read a cover letter. So it's something that, you know, I would I would not say 100% guarantees that, you know, you will stand out, right? To me, a strong resume is of greater value than just having, you know, than just doing a, a halfway resume and putting a cover letter, right? A strong resume is of key importance in recruitment. Okay, so some tips. One size does not fit all, right? A good resume should be tailored for respective job roles. Um, I, I think most of us, right, we are guilty of we have one resume and we see a job application and we just send that resume. This, uh, this does not augur well for you, right? Because every job application is going to be a little bit different. The requirements are going to be different, right? The, the role and what the job entails is going to be different. So you want to tailor your resume. So when you see a job application, you should not focus only on the job title, right? But you should really review a job application properly. Ensure you understand what the requirements are. Ensure that you meet the requirements. And therefore, you want to reflect your resume as meeting the requirements by ensuring you have the keywords. You want to understand what the role is asking for. So what are some of the duties that will need to be performed? And if you would have performed these duties in any of your past work experience, you want to ensure that you include this in your resume. Because again, as I mentioned, a lot of times, especially in large organizations, a software is going to be reviewing your resume as first, first pass. And it's going to be looking for keywords. So you want to tailor that resume, right? Um, also, you want to, when you see a, a job application, you also want to review the, the organization, the company, understand what this company is about. You know, if it's a company that's big on corporate social responsibility, if it's a company that's big on sales, you know, things that they look up forward to achieving, if they're into bottom line, 
it in, in, into environmental impact. And again, you want to tailor your resume to suit. So you should no longer have one resume that you print a million copies for, that you send out to every employer, or that every job on Caribbean Jobs, you are uploading the same resume. You want to ensure it's tailored to suit. Okay? And so I went into the other point about looking for keywords in your job posting and ensuring that your resume is adjusted to reflect such. Use professional font, right? Because employers only have a short time to review your resume, it should be as clear and as re easy to read as possible. So the fancy italics and the comic sans and so forth, while it may look pretty, unless you are applying for a role of a graphic designer, where you want to show your skills in terms of Photoshop and being able to edit, you know, you should not be using all these fancy fonts. You want to keep it professional, right? Also, something to be mindful of, certain fonts, depending on the, um, the, 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 the version um, of Office that a recruiter may have, some fonts may not translate to your to a recruiter. So you want to stick to the basic ones, the Arial, the Times New, Ro New Roman, Cambria. I mean, you could go through and there are nice ones, but again, you want it to be clear, concise, easy to read. Include only the most relevant information and put the most important information first, right? And I, we touched on that earlier, right? Whereby you may have extensive work or educational experience, but yeah, you right. do need to include all if you are high in your career, okay? Use active language, right? I would have mentioned that before, right? In terms of power words, such as achieve, earned, completed, manage, launch, soul, accomplish, right? These are words that stand out uh, on a, a recruiter because an organization wants someone who is a doer, someone who achieves, you know, objectives. Proofread and edit, right? Before sending out your resume, you should read it several times, right? To ensure that there are no spelling or grammar errors. Also, sometimes, you know, when you are looking, reading the same thing over and over, you may not pick up on, on an error so it may be it is advisable that you let someone else also read your resume okay sometimes you should print your resume also because when you're looking at it on a computer screen compared to when you print it and you go through it you can you might better be able to pick up on errors because grammatical errors make a difference and especially if you come across a very picky recruiter right mm -hmm. they and there are a lot of errors they can put you on the, at the bottom of the pile or not shortlist you based on that, right? And especially in an era where recruiters may have a lot of resumes, they, they have the ability to be picky with resumes because they have, uh, the ball is in their court, okay? Call attention to important achievements, right? We would have spoken about that, about highlighting your achievements, so your skills, so you want to put that higher up on your resume. Okay, formatting. You want to ensure that your resume, when you submit it, is in a format that is easy for a recruiter to open, right? Um, and you need to be mindful of different versions and size of a document, right? Um, because many offices may have email restrictions. So let's start with the format. As a recruiter, right, I would have come across, you know, you get a resume and uh, you click and you cannot open it. And if you have 100 more resumes to go, you may not uh, even bother to reply back to the candidate asking them to submit it in a format that is, you know, readable. So you want to stick to formats such as Word, um, PDF, I would say stay away from JPEGs, right? OneDrive, you know, now you can send links, right? Through Google Drive and, and so forth where you send a link 
and the recruiter has to go on the link or you send it via WeTransfer, depending on the organization, um, depending on what their, their software is or their office suite, they may not be able to open it or they may experience difficulties with opening links. So you want to really stick, you want to stick to basics. So Word or PDF, I would say uh, things that you would, you should, the format that you should submit your resume in. Um, you want to be mindful of the size of the document. So yes, you want your resume to look pretty and therefore you might do it in Publisher, right? Um, if you have that ability, but you want to save it uh, in a format like PDF, but you want to ensure that you do not use so many fancy graphics that the that the size of the file is too large so it does not reach the recruiter because some organizations they have uh, email restrictions on the size of an email that can be received from the outside so these are things to just you know consider when you are emailing your resume in this day and age i would say it is important and i don't say it's important but it is advisable to send your resume, even though you may send hard copy, most organizations operate uh, soft. So they want a soft version of your resume, right? One where they can easily just email it to the other hiring managers to review, or one where they can easily save it on your recruitment pool, right? So as much as possible, try to email resumes uh, even though you may send it hard copy. Printable resume. You want to ensure that your resume, because when, uh, if you are shortlisted, the recruiter will print the resume, more than likely, because organizations want to save costs. It may not be printed in nice color, but it might print in grayscale or black and white. So you want to ensure, especially if your resume has a lot of graphics or a lot of colors and background colors, you want to ensure that when it is printed, it is still easy to read and it is it is it is visible, right? So when you create your resume, print a copy to ensure that it is a, a version that is easy for a recruiter and the interview panel to look at. And be honest. As uh, tough as the job market may be, you want to be honest in your resume. Do not fluff, do not uh, put things that you know the, you, you think the recruiter thinks you should do or state uh, that you you have achieved something that you have not or that you have performed a task that you have not because the truth always comes out, right? Whether it be at the interview stage, a reference, reference check, and that will not work in your favor. So always be honest in your resume. Okay. All right. So this brings me to the end. Any questions, comments, uh, anything else anyone would like to add? Um, first things first, thank you so much, Miss Miss Munsi. A very informative, very well done uh, presentation. I see we have a lot. Any questions that you have now, uh, you all may post it. I see we have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, if you want, I will read through the questions and then you can answer. If that's okay. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay. So, first question I see from Dave. Uh, he asks, what a master's degree helps someone stand out? Yes, sir. It, well, again, it all depends on your role, right? Okay. So, uh, Right now, we have what you call a very knowledgeable workforce in Trinidad, which is a good thing, right? Um, but when applying for rules, it, it depends on the role that you are applying for, right? So if you are applying, obviously, for, for jobs whereby it asks for a master's level, you must include, and you have such an ach achievement, you must include that. I think what you're asking is if you are asked, if you are applying for something lower level, whether or not you should purposely omit your master's degree. Now, personally, from my perspective, I would say no, because uh, 
it for organizations who really value knowledge in a workforce uh, having a master's uh, even for what you would say entry level roles or lower level roles is not necessarily a bad thing because this person is going to be coming with um, uh, a lot more information knowledge which can work uh, in favor of the organization so personally i would say you should uh, include it in your resume right if you find yourself uh, getting a feedback that you are overqualified uh, maybe you might want to not put it in your resume um, personal choice but maybe in the interview you know because again the, 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 your resume is just your first put in the door basically to the organization so if you feel it's working against you but again personal choice you cannot omit it but in the interview you should state it you know indicate you know you have uh, such an achievement and you could be honest why you may not have included it maybe based on you know prior experiences and so forth you didn't want to be prejudged yeah so i kind of hope that answers your question yeah um i believe it should um i'll just kind of summarize because they've asked a lot of questions um one important thing that a lot of students would like to know is the concept of gpa so a lot of students, that's, that's the hot topic. If you don't have a 3.6 GPA, it might be considered good enough. In some companies, 3.0 is not considered good enough. What is your experience in terms of GPA, in terms of a resume? Okay, so I will give you, I mean, because I would have been in your position, you know, I'm sorry to say now it's way back when, huh? but you know, when you're in university, you know, the first class honors, the GPA, you know, it's something you strive for and you're proud. And it is something that you should strive for and be proud of when you achieve, right? Um, at that level, when you now graduate, you would see for certain job roles, especially for internship programs, graduate training programs, because uh, they know persons do not have a lot of experience, one of the criteria they use for shortlisting which you will see in the, in the requirements is that they ask for, they will actually state, you know, first class honors or so upper seconds and above, right? You see that uh, for these type of rules. And that's why I would say that in those cases, if you have it, you must state it, right? When you move up further in your career and therefore your experience, you build on your experience. Uh, and I could say this personally, because I have, you know, the same first class and so forth. And I don't want to sound, you know, I don't want to sound bad, but nobody cares, right? Um, because uh, you have the minimum standard, which is a degree. And what more importantly, when you reach midway in your career, is that you have experience. Because you will be at a point whereby, you know, somebody who graduated with lower seconds and somebody graduated with first class, will both have five years of experience but guess what if the person who graduated with lower class lower second um has more of a work experience that shows that they are able to achieve their objectives they're closing out projects they're hitting their deliverables and therefore more than a person who has the first class honors that is the person that is going to get the job right so it is important because how I, I view how I view academic achievements is that each level is a foundation for your next level. So when we would have done when you would have done CXC, obviously you aim to get ones because ones would have meant you know going on to A levels. And when you went on to A levels, you wanted to get you know or CSEC as it may be the grade ones, the grade two, the A's and the B's because this now is the criteria for which you would be accepted in to do your degree, right? And when you do your degree, again, this is now the criteria to get to the next level. But when you reach that point in your career where your work experience is extensive and you achieve stuff, it does not matter that you have 12 ones. That will not matter again to an employer when, you, when they are looking for a manager, right? but to move through the different levels it helps you to move through the different levels 
Yeah, so I kind of hope that, you know, again, answers your question. Okay. Um, I'll take a question from Johan. Is a four to five page resume too long? Yes. I think we covered, yeah, I think we covered that um, prior. Yeah. Unless you are a CEO of some multinational company whereby you have extensive experience, you know, working in different countries, you know, managing and achieving, I would say your resume should not be four to five pages. You may need to review your resume to make it more concise. Typically, I would say two to three pages is a good length because no recruiter, if you are entry level or depending on even mid-career, is going to read through five pages of, you know, of a resume. Okay, um, Jasmine has a question. Anything in particular to leave out in a resume? unless asked for like what is the biggest mistakes that people put on resumes so i mean i want to advise things to omit eh? i would say things that are relevant so demographic data i i personally think that you know if it's something that's not required can't work against you so you should you should omit such information if it's irrelevant. Um, I mean, be honest, again, it's a, it comes down to what is re relevant and applicable to the job, right? So if the job is looking for, you know, wants to show your sales experience, but you would have worked, uh, you know, as a, you know, at a food outlet for like about five years. Well, you don't need to put that. You know, it comes down to relevance and applicability. I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, I would have done teaching, right? I would have done teaching as a, I was, I was a tu tutor, right? So when I am applying for roles that, uh, you know, that, uh, re that, need, that I need to show my, academic background in terms of teaching, I would include that in my resume. But when I am applying for roles uh, related to professional or for work organizations, they are not interested that I teach a human resource management course. It's not applicable. So in a case like that, I would leave out that because it is not applicable. So again, I will stress the importance of reviewing what the job ad is asking and providing the relevant information. Okay, thanks. Uh, personal question from me. What, in terms of engineering skills, because I believe you've worked in the engineering, in the oil and gas sector and in other engineering companies as well. What are some key words, some key skills that you really want to see in a resume that would get these people to, to get their jobs? Okay, so you want to show, so the thing with engineering is that when you apply for a job, it is, the first shortlisting is your academic qualification, which everybody will have. That's why you apply for the job in the first place. Okay, what you want to see is your achievement, right? If you are a project engineer, you want to highlight projects that you would have worked, that you would have led, um, you close out your ability to close out projects in a timely manner, budget, meet, meeting budgets, right? If you are a mechanical engineer, you want to show achievements, again, related to your discipline, right? This, these are the things you want to, that will stand out in an engineering resume, right? Projects that you would have worked on, maybe different plants that you would have worked on, right? Um, in the oil and gas sector, I would say, and I'm still in oil and gas, so that's why I'm kind of thinking on projects because in the engineering sector, we have, uh, you have disciplined engineers and you want to see the, the extent of their experience, right? So if they would have worked on a, um, a project that, you know, involve uh, laying down a pipeline or if they were, if there was a construction project that they were involved in, so sometimes for engineers, 
where you have projects, you might actually want to have a, a section where you list the projects that you would have worked on, right? Um, or turnarounds, you know, if you were part of a turnaround achievement and, and so forth. The, these are kind of some of the things that we, we look for. You don't want your resume to be a, a job description. Your work experience should not be a, jo a job description. Okay. Yep, great, great information. Um, is, and I don't believe there's any more. If there's no more questions, we'd like to move forward with the next portion of the presentation, which is ASHRAE related. Um, here to present is Mr. Kira Nanan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Risa. And, and thanks again, Risa. Yeah, I just wanted to say, really helpful. Can't appreciate you enough. No problem. Have a good night. Thanks. Okay. Have a good night, Risa. We'll chat after. Hi. Um, yes. I we will chat after. Uh, Risa is actually someone I've known for about uh, 10 years, maybe more. <laughs> so um, she started off, very, she was very, very young then. And we were both very, very young then as well. I would like to think I'm still young. I, I get an old age. I, I would say that much. But my resume is actually four pages. So now I have to go back and, and start doing some cutting down. And I have to figure out where I could cut things from. So uh, thanks again, Risa. So for the ASHRAE um, Trinidad student branch members and the non-members, this is a guide of what we're going to have coming up in the uh, upcoming weeks. So one of the things that we're going to have to get done is we're going to do for the student branch members trial interviews. So we will have in these trial interviews, uh, reviews of your resume, your cover letter, um, you'll go through an interview process. And this is just some guidelines of how it is going to be and some words of advice for how we're going to actually conduct the interviews. The interviews are actually going to be done virtually. So you will get some feedback on it. This uh, is a part of our professional development training. So uh, to be a member of the student branch, you can log on to ashray.com.org, sorry, and sign up as a student branch member. And um, this is some of the benefits that you can get from your um, from being a member of the Trinidad, of the student branch. So important information that you need to know, right? Uh, two job postings were posted last night on the base camp for the Trinidad student branch on the message board. They are under trial interviews. You may only apply for one of these two job postings unless we advise you, which we will do via uh, base camp as well. The deadline for uh, submitting your resume is, is Wednesday, 17th June at 6 30 p.m. Submissions must be done to the ashray caricom at gmail.com email address. Please info and make sure that your format for these emails is your first name, last name, hyphen, and the job title, which you're choosing, which will be trial one or trial two. Right? Make sure your email address includes all attachments, including cover letter and resume. Resumes must be in PDF format. Please do not send us any in Word. Um, we will not be re reviewing any in Word format. Um, once you have submitted uh, by the 17th of June, you'll be an assigned an interview panel. The interview panel will conduct interviews via GoToMeeting, which is the uh, platform that we are using right now. Interviews will be conducted at 6.30 on a scheduled date, and you will receive an e email notification Prior to your interview, you will receive this one week before your interview. Interviews will consist of various persons from various organizations, not limited to, but inclusive of human resource managers, engineers, consultants, business development officers, and business owners. Uh, the interview panel will conduct interviews, and once completed, they will rate and discuss uh, possible improvements with you at that point in time. Right. Preparing for an online interview. Um, we pull some information from online, and this is pretty much what you guys have to make sure. Some quick guidelines. So your, your perfect profile picture. Please have a high resolution photo, dressed professionally, and a solid color or light background. You can see my picture. 
that's my profile picture for my professional email. Uh, do not leave your profile blank. Use an icon instead of a photo. Please don't have a selfie or a group shot. This is the advice that we're giving you and the interviews will be conducted as if it is a professional real life interview. So please ensure that you take these pieces of advice. Make sure that your, your, your IT is good. Make sure you have enough bandwidth to conduct the interviews. Make sure your wired connections is close to where you are. Download your software updates before and please ensure that your microphone and camera works. You're preparing for the call. So make sure you have a clean and quiet venue. We don't want to get any background noise. Remember, we want to look professional, sound professional. Use a simple light, light color background. Make sure that you have proper lighting so that you can see yourself on the on your camera and we can see you. We'll make, make a test call. Make sure your equipment work in. Make sure your webcam is fixed properly, your face is properly fixed. All your security settings is sorted. Any programs that you don't need for interview, please do not have them open. Print a copy of your resume and have a file, have the file ready in case we need to get it back or if you need to share your screen. Place your sticky notes um, with your talking points somewhere along where you could be. I use QCAD for my interviews, so if I have interviews to conduct, I have a list of questions in QCAD. And practice answering your questions um, on camera. Please don't be shy. It's a job interview, but and it's a trial, but we want to make sure that you get these things perfect because that's a benefit of being a member of the student branch. Right? Use your nonverbal skills. Right? So your body language, your tone of voice, you need to make sure you have good control of this. Dress the part, even though it's online. Please make sure you're dressed properly, wear a shirt, a tie, you can put on a jacket and a shirt, look, you know, make sure you're where we are seeing visible is, is looking pre presentable and you're looking like you're actually going to interview. Make sure that we can understand you clearly. Please do not speed. Look at the camera, not the screen, nod your hair or nod your hair. Make sure you nod your head if you understand something to show that you understand or give a thumbs up. In some cases, I gave thumbs up in some of mine. Don't frown, um, you know, don't do any kind of weird facial reactions. Please do not speak too loudly or too softly that we have to ask you to repeat yourself because we wasn't audible, right? Slouching, leaning backwards is a big no-no. Remember that we're going to be seeing you on camera. So it's going to be as if you are in an actual interview. Make sure that you position yourself not too far and not too close to the camera so that we can see you properly. On a positive note, after the interview, you know, leave a lasting impression. Make sure you state your interest for your job, the job that you're looking at. Thank the interviewer for his or her time. This, in our case, will be a panel. Ask if there's anything else that you can provide, references, with samples. You could shoot an email back to them uh, and, you know, just tell them thanks for the, the information, thanks for the, you know, everything that they have done for the interview. And ask what's the next process, next step, right? It's a pretty simple. Anybody have any questions? Um, you can unmute your mic and um, ask the questions. I'm fine with that. So if anybody has any questions. All right, Hi. Omar, that's you. Uh, no, someone else. Um, you could speak a little louder, please. Or you could just type in. Uh, could you hear me? Yeah, I'm here, you know. Um, so I had an interview with Slumberger, and they had a place where they up to upload videos, right? It's not a live interview. Okay. Um, I didn't have a good webcam, so I use my iPad, right? But when you use an iPad, uh, you could upload videos, so it's like you bypass the time on the website, right? But okay. obviously, you're going to keep it within the time. But you think that will be a turn-off for the company? Because you're, you're not 
doing a live recording anymore, you're uploading a video and you're kind of bypassing the timer, but you're still keeping it within the time limit. So, um, most companies will have different ways and means of conducting interviews. Um, I know Slumberger, they generally do a whole different bunch of things. Um, the main thing is that you keep to your time limit, right? Even if you don't reach your time limit, whoever is conducting the interview will probably cut you when you reach your timer. They wouldn't want to hear you after that because of the, the amount of um, videos that they have to review. Um, so one of the things that I would suggest is um, keeping it concise and, and keeping it to the time limit. Um, for our trial interviews, um, there is no time limit because we want to get as much done and, and give the exposure and, and give the students the benefits of of um of improvements for themselves to conduct an interview that we don't want to say okay we're going to give you 15 minutes to, and then um we have somebody being nervous that they have 15 minutes to talk so while we will schedule the um the interviews we'll leave it with sufficient time that um that if needed they can handle themselves properly um so i hope i answer your question for you they can let me know if yeah i'm here no? yeah I'm, I'm here it's just to make sure that you keep your keep your time limits uh and know if generally if i do a presentation and i know i have a time limit here i, I try to keep to my talking points have notes jotted down and talk about what i need to actually the important information and something that will will grab their attention I have one more question. Um, okay, well, for the students, the applications, uh, somebody that finished UE, could they also apply for the, um, the yeah. member, the student membership, and also that job application you're talking about? So, this is a trial interview. So, what we've gotten is we've gotten some, um, we'd have looked at a couple um, job postings that we would have passed and we would have reviewed them and changed it from, so it's no longer real companies you're applying to. You're applying to, 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 try, to dummy companies, but we want to give the students proper exposure that they have the real life exposure of an interview panel if you go to a regular job. It normally consists of an HR manager, a uh, head of department, and somebody else who, you know, maybe a consultant or somebody somebody important. So it's generally three persons who will conduct interviews. So we go in with the same frame of thought in that these uh, interviews are going to be um, practically like a real-life interview, except that there is no real-life job for it. So we want to make sure that students prepare themselves for when it is really going to happen for them, that they know how to answer questions, um, present this, their, their resume, do a cover letter, answer quest, pra practice answering questions then, to be comfortable in speaking to people who are, are going to potentially be their managers. Um, and to answer your question, yes, you can join the, the student branch. Um, you just need to the, the form people and join as a student okay thanks uh, i will i will insert the link to join the student branch in the chat yeah cool perfect Gumar. um any other questions the for the members who are uh, student members the base camp has the job interviews please go and review it um it's an opportunity for you all to to benefit a lot um that's something that you know we're going to need you all to 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 get to make sure you get on board because we're gonna have the panel is already sorted it's just to conduct the interviews now um the panel has been put in place once all of the um the resumes have come in we would disseminate them to the necessary persons and they would then give us some feedback and um it'll probably be we have 20 members if all 20 apply 
we should probably do all um be able to do the interviews within a week okay from the city we'll probably and, and the, the interviews will be conducted after the 20th correct yeah it will be conducted after the 20th okay right. we have exams i believe up to the 16th up to the yeah so i think we should be should be fine everybody should be in the correct frame of mind to be able to conduct these interviews um besides that everybody should be in the correct frame of mind to also um submit their resumes please remember the deadline to submit it. I forgot about that, yeah. is, is the 6th of uh it's not the 6th 17th of june at 6 p.m correct yeah right. so i think using i believe that all of this will be available online um in the resume session as well as um Kieran's presentation on the YouTube page. So in case you missed anything, you can always go back and, and review them. So you could always um in case you could make sure that your resume is up to the standard that Risa would want. So I would encourage everyone to to do that. All right. So um